the, uh, the idea of this, uh, I should, right, sorry. <laughs> um, the, the uh, yeah, can I just come over here? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, it's like, you know, being at a school, you know, performance. <laughs> kind, of, kind of shuffles on and shuffles off. So, uh, anyway, this is, um, uh, the, the, what, uh, what we're trying to do in this first session is just to kind of very quickly give you some experiences of people who are using or thinking or planning to use core in, in different contexts. And uh, I, I just asked these, uh, these four people um, who are in, in different sort of si situations. Uh, so Tara is going to go first. Tara is going to report from the front line from an experienced user. And then we're going to go to Robbie, who is going to tell you about a baptism of fire. And then we'll go to Alan, who is calmly planning, and Gerhardt as well, who's uh, in the planning and implementation phase. So Tara, you first. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks. Thanks so much, Wendy. Really excited to be here. Um, I'm teaching in, I'm from Trinity College Dublin, um, and I teach, obviously, the Introduction to Economics course there. I'm teaching the, the micro module. Um, so to start, give you some context. This is, I have a, a large class, about 400 students, and they come from very diverse backgrounds. So many of them will have studied economics before at, at kind of a secondary school level. Many of them have never seen economics before at all. And they also would have a very diverse level of, of maths background. Some have studied it to higher level in school, some have not. Um, and so that, that's the kind of first challenge is dealing with that, that variety. Also in terms of the degree that they will go on to, some of them will go on, many of them will go on to do a degree in economics, but also for many of them, this is the only economics that they will ever do. And so that's something I've, I've been quite conscious of as well. So I've been teaching the, um, the core curriculum now for two years. I've really, really enjoyed it. Um, and I feel it fits very well with kind of my style of teaching. And I think that the students have responded very well to it. So I'll tell you a few of the, the things that, I, that I've kind of really liked about it and how it fits in with the, with the way that I teach. So one of the first things is the fact that the way that the, the material is presented, a lot of it is grounded and presented initially in terms of empirical facts are brought into, into the course. And I think that this is hugely important for students to be able to connect to the material. You know, economics is a practical subject, especially for students who have not seen any economics before, getting them immediately interested by presenting them with an important kind of policy question um, that's, that's based on real data, I think is really, really valuable. And this is something I would have tried to do before anyway, drawing on real world examples. For example, in Dublin, our rental market is insane. The students are very, very conscious of this. So this is something we kind of talk about. How do, you, how do you resolve this? What are various policies? But this naturally fits, I think, with, the, with a lot of the ways that, that things are presented in, um, in the core textbook. A second aspect um, that I like a lot is the way that models are presented and, and dealt with and the role of models. That, uh, that is being presented to students. Again, this is something that I have found, you know, in other um, kind of more traditional textbooks were not presented in this way of dealing with, you know, the role of assumptions and different types of models for different questions. I think in an introductory course, there's this danger that students come away with the sense of this is the model, these are the assumptions in economics. And the, the material in core very much says, OK, for this question, we need this model. For another question, we use another model. And I think that's important for students to get that early on. That's something that can be challenging for students to think in that kind of abstract uh, way. They may not be used to it and, and, and working with different types of models. To help them to do that, I, I use you know, the classic example of a map, um, but showing them three different maps all of Dublin to understand that you can have different models all of the same thing. So uh, a map of a pedestrian map with all of the tourist sites, a public transport map, uh, a map with roads uh, for driving around to help them to understand these all represent the same thing, different assumptions, different ones that you use at different points in time. Um, and again, that fits in very well with, I think, the way the material is, is presented. Um, then the, the other thing that I, I like a lot about the material that, again, kind of has fit quite well with the way that, that I like to teach is that the, the examples that are used, I think, are very intuitive for students in, in, and help them to connect to, uh, to the material. Um, and this helps to get interaction in classes. So in, in, in the large lecture, I use polls so students can respond via their mobile uh, phone in the, in the lectures. Um, 
But this helps like, to do this at the beginning of a lecture to get them connected to it, to ask them something, to kind of use their intuition. For example, for the chapter that's, that's looking at the, the labor-leisure um, trade-off, I would start by asking them, you know, if you, if you had a job, your uh, wage increased by 10 euro per hour, would you work more or would you work less? Now, if it worked by 100 euro, uh, increased by 100 euro per hour, would you work more or would you work less? And at the very beginning, students intuitively understand that trade-off between earning more money um, and having more free time. They're getting income and substitution effects essentially very quickly without knowing that that's what they're called. But using that example, I think, is much more intuitive than you know, the classic just consumer goods to consumer goods you know, way that that's presented. So, and then that example kind of goes through um, the, the chapter. So those are some of the things that I really, I really enjoyed. And again, I find that it fits very well with the way that I like to teach economics. And I enjoy teaching it more, which means that I'm, I'm a better teacher. right? I'm more kind of you know, passionate about, about the subject when I'm teaching it. Some of the things that I find uh, difficult, of course, that uh, most of them, I think, are just to do with the transition from uh, teaching in a slightly different way and presenting material in a slightly different way. So some of the material is quite, is quite challenging, actually. I think even more challenging some of the ideas than in you know, a, a kind of traditional intro course, um, especially dealing with, with lots of different kind of abstract models. This is fine. I think this is very, very good for students. But of course, in, in a large class of, of 400 students, that presents a challenge when teaching. That's when the tutorials become really, really important and the teaching assistants become really important because, of course, I don't give the tutorials. But the teaching assistants were taught themselves in a different way. right? So that means that they have, have to go through an adjustment process as well. Um, and you're kind of relying on them to do that well. I've been very, very fortunate and have had really excellent teaching assistants. But you know, that, that may vary, and you don't know how, how easy that is to adapt. So, and I know that I think there's going to be a session here about working with TAs, which I'm really looking forward to. Another challenge that, again, I think is, is part of the, the transition is that the students who come in who have studied economics before sometimes are a little bit resistant to being taught in a different way. So the, the curriculum for the Leaving Cert Economics in School in Ireland is pretty much identical to a, a standard intro uh, level course. And that's what they're expecting. So they're expecting that they're going to know everything when they come in. And they're expecting to see supply and demand first um, and to be taught in that way. And all of a sudden, they find they're a bit confused by certain things that they're seeing. Um, and, and again, they're a bit resistant to that. Again, this is not something I have a problem with. I think that's good for them. Um, but I think it's useful to set expectations at the beginning to say, look, this may be different from what you've seen before. That's OK. You know, we'll, we'll guide you through it. And then the final thing is the kind of transition at the departmental level. The, our, my department has been very supportive of me adopting a core. But at the moment, I'm the only one doing it. And um, so the micro part is, is based on, on core, but the macro part is not. I'm working on my macro colleague. I'm confident we're going to go in that direction. Um, but also, I think that the link between the intro part and the uh, second year intermediate uh, economics is not as, as fluid as I would I would like I think and so there's a kind of a little bit of an adjustment for them when they get into second year but again that's just something we're working on working on with my colleagues to to make work um, but overall I would say very 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 positive experience great okay. that's, uh, that's I think very helpful Tara um, it shows that you can survive yeah. um, <laughs> uh, in a very big class very heterogeneous students Robbie. right okay Good morning, everyone. I was very interesting to hear Tara talking there very much in terms of the content and the way in which she teaches as an individual. Now, my experience is rather different. My name is Robbie Mochrie. I'm uh, formerly the head of econo the economics undergraduate program at Heriot Watch University in Edinburgh um, and Dubai and Malaysia. <laughs> so there you are. That's the first challenge that I have, managing teaching across three very different cultures. And I'm not in the position where I just go, oh, I'll adopt this book. Rather, what I'm doing is thinking, what is going to work, not for a class of 400, but for a class of 1,200? We also have recently got involved with um, a, a, an initiative by the Scottish Government called the Graduate Apprentice Programme. And this means that mature students are coming into university one day a week. And on Friday mornings, we get to teach, or on some Friday mornings, we get to teach them economics. Let me tell you that when you see a group of mature Scottish students sitting in a room with their arms folded, and they're Scottish, 
So they don't really do this happiness thing. You know, I, I come in and I can see the cloud of scepticism hanging above the class. Go on, impress me. It's a very different situation to be in to what it is with other students. And I think that one of the interesting things about teaching those students is that they come to the class and they have hundreds of questions and they have loads of experience of real life. And they think they should be able to understand everything the first time they see it because that's really what they've got used to in their jobs. And suddenly we're throwing difficult concepts at them that they don't understand. I pick up very much on the point that Tara made, that those students who've studied economics before are perhaps expecting a warm bath as they go into economics in exactly the same way. But I would put that feeling that we're trying to create, which is to make those students somewhat uncomfortable and not certain about the nature of their, the extent of their knowledge in a slightly different way. Those students who are carrying on with economics we want to be uncomfortable because what we're wanting them to do is to acquire a range of skills which are very different from the skills which would have got them through university, uh, through, through, through high school or um, uh, some, some kind of pre-university training. Now, what that means is that we're wanting our students to start approaching material and thinking, what's the question here? So within, oh, by, by the way, with, within all of this, why, why was it a baptism of fire as Wendy put it? Well, Roughly speaking, what happened was we made the decision to adopt CORE in, I think it was April last year. I sent one of my colleagues who's got responsibility for a large part of first year teaching down to the uh, workshop in, Warri uh, sorry, in Bristol last year. She came back. She was tremendously enthusiastic about it. Um, and then we discovered one problem. We had been thinking very clearly about moving to a system where because my university doesn't have a large enough lecture theatre for all our students. What we would do is we would use two lecture theatres and we'd have a video feed between them with lecturers in each room so that rather than just the lecturer being didactic, I'm going to tell you what I know about economics. The students would immediately be introduced to conversation about economics and to understand that they should be questioning everything that the assumptions which they came to university with are not necessarily the right assumptions. And to understand that learning takes place better, to understand better that learning takes place within discussion. We've mentioned tutorials already, I'll come on to those in a minute, but of course what we normally expect is that that's where discussions are going to take place. Roughly a month before we were going to roll this plan out, our IT department decided that it couldn't actually support it. So we had to change plan. And what we did was something which was even bolder, even more imaginative, minister, even more courageous, um, in which we decided to abandon lectures completely. And instead, what we did was to record a series of podcasts. Now, I've done enough digital innovation with students to know that the worst thing I can do is to assume that just because young people are digital natives, they know how to um, uh, go around, na navigate a digital landscape effectively. And what we did, I think, was fail to give these young people sufficient direction about what they were going to be studying. So we've got all sorts of problems that we threw in to the mix at the same time. We've got students who are going, when are we going to see a lecturer? because that's one of the things we expected at university. And we were going, well, actually, you could see the lecturer for 15 minutes each day. You know, it's, it was actually quite nice. Our, instead of a two-hour lecture block, what we were releasing at 2 p.m. every afternoon, there would be the economics podcast. And it was interesting to see the reaction. As I say, first-year students completely thrown by this. We also have a group of students from fourth year actuarial science take this. Their response was completely different. They knew what was required at university. They were saying, this is absolutely perfect. Why, why are we doing this in all our classes? So there is an element here that we've got to remember that not only are we dealing with people who are coming to university perhaps for the first time, perhaps studying economics for the first time, perhaps have expectations about what economics teaching should be because they've had so much of it before, we realised that what we had done effectively was to fail to give people the signposts they needed. Now, because we had such a short period of time, because of various other things, I had recorded most of the micro component of our first course before we actually started using these podcasts. 
my colleague, who I would have to say um, uh, uh, thought that he was learning from my experience, was very disappointed to discover that by the time they got to his podcasts, most students had presumably found some other way of getting the information. So we're not quite sure. We thought we were using CORE. We're not quite sure what the students thought we were, we were doing. Because our impression is that our first year students, <laughs> rather than engaging with the material that we had, were going to other online sources. And we can see this in assessments. We can see this in the way in which students have answered exam questions that there is far less use of the material that we delivered than we expected. And so we've spent quite a bit of time trying to understand this. And one of the things which we wanted to do was to set up focus groups and to understand what it was that students liked, what they didn't like, what they engaged with, what they didn't engage with. We have been unable to get in con or we've been unable to get a response from students for this. Now again, I'm going to compare this. We were running a similar exercise with a, a, a similar um, a call for participation and focus groups with third and fourth year students, which we had to close off after 24 hours when one eighth of the class responded. So what we are fairly certain of is that there are some things which are wrong. If I come to CORE itself, um, uh, what, what I liked about it very much and why I was pushing for it to be adopted is that it seems to me to offer a very different approach to teaching economics to what I've seen before. It does seem to be one which in effect sets up a series of problems and then asks people to, under, to, to develop their own understanding of it. It seems naturally, and we've talked about games already, or we've mentioned games already, and experiments which may be useful, but it seems very naturally, and the approach which we are taking should also lead very naturally to this, to a gamified approach to learning, in which people are pacing themselves, in which they're getting rewards, in some sense, for participation, for, 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 demonstrating, for, for, for demonstrating understanding. But what we haven't been able to do and this is something which one of my colleagues in marketing has been in um, the marketing discipline at Harriet Watt has been saying is well what effectively is what we need to do is in some sense to create a sense of epic meaning. I love the phrase, epic meaning. Um, economics as the more effectively as the Odyssey, um, presumably with fewer opportunities to die um, or lose your memory, but economics as a journey of transformation. Now that's something which we're working on. It's something which we know our first steps were rather too bold, but equally it's something which I think in the next few years we are going to be able to make substantial changes. Now I'll finish on this point, and I think that uh, Tara actually made it quite clear that what she's done is to introduce CORE on her own. What we're thinking about is how does CORE relate to the rest of our curriculum? And we're in a slightly different position in, Scottish, in a Scottish institution because we have a four-year degree. So we can be very general in our introduction in first year and then save much of the theory until second and third year. What are students, though, well, the question that, that, that comes from this, uh, from, from our explorations, what are students who've been exposed to core in first year going to be looking for in economics in second and third year? Will they have acquired the skills, or been more effective in acquiring the skills, which are necessary for self-directed learning? Not for, me, for us to teach them, although National Student Survey suggests we do a reasonable good job of that, but the skills which are going to be necessary for our students to take their understanding from first year and start to build on that so that by the time that our students are graduating at the end of fourth year, we are actually sending professional economists out into the labour force. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, so uh, no, I think I'm going to go to Alan next. Sure. So, yeah. Okay, so um, 
thank you everyone and thank you Wendy for the invitation to come here. I'm hoping to learn a lot about uh, CORE as we begin uh, uh, to think about uh, implementing this in, in, in September. So what I wanted to do just to talk about, um, my name is Alan de Bromhead, I'm from Queen's Management School at Queen's University Belfast. Um, and what I wanted to say was really about our experience of planning uh, for CORE and, and the sort of practicalities involved with uh, getting this thing into shape so that we could actually go and deliver it in, in September. So what we wanted to do as part of CORE at Queen's was to, to make this the bedrock of, of our economics programs um, that we offered, to make it a compulsory course for all of our economics degrees in whatever shape or form they took, whether it was a single honour economics or business economics or students with a major in, in economics and a minor in another subject in the management school. Um, so we really wanted to target the students that were, uh, uh, had chosen economics as, as in some form in their degree. Um, but of course this would have implications for students that we taught who uh, wouldn't be going on to do further economics, students who were studying accounting or finance. I'll talk a little bit about that later. But what this meant, we'd have a group of about 150 students or so to teach. Um, previous to, to CORE, or up until now, we've had an introductory module in Queen's that was several hundred students uh, uh, in size. And this is, so we're, we're having a smaller cohort of students that are going to be to, taught CORE, uh, uh, the economy. Um, and we discussed about how best to uh, actually fit CORE into our, our offering at Queen's. And we were quite uh, uh, certain that we wanted a, a year-long core course. Okay, so it would be spread out across the entire year. Two modules. At Queen's we have a modularized system, um, which means that they're all supposed to be interchangeable modules and self-contained. Um, we weren't particularly happy with that system, and we wanted to make sure that we didn't uh, try and cram core into one module and try and make sure that we got the most out of it if we're going to be offering this as our kind of flagship uh, uh, foundation for first-year economic students. But again, this has implications, which I'll discuss a little bit later. Um, trying to fit this year-long module into a, a uh, modularized system meant that we were replacing lots of smaller modules. Um, and all of this had lots of knock-on effects that we had to really think through when we were um, planning out, out our, our, our degree programs. Um, not just for our own programs in terms of economics, but also for those that we were teaching um, from other degree pathways. So what was really behind our decision to adopt CORE? Well, I think fundamentally it, it, it was just that enough of us in the group actually believed in what, what CORE was about and liked the approach that uh, CORE was taking, um, had been visited by, by Alvin Birdie and, 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 and Wendy, um, and were really shown the, 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 the difference that the CORE could make to second year students, the difference it would mean for our teaching. Um, and I think just most of us just bought into the, the idea. And it wasn't too tough a sell. Um, nonetheless, it did take a sort of small group of people, like any major change, I guess, it takes a small group of dedicated people to actually push it through, to go through the meetings, to, to bother with all of the paperwork that it was required to do to get this through. Um, and this was, was, was key to getting it actually uh, off the ground. Reception amongst the, 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 the group at, at, at Queen's, most people were, were pretty positive. Um, some people were sort of indifferent to it. They would probably teach whatever they were given uh, uh, and are not too concerned about what, what form that teaching would, would uh, uh, take. Uh, and then, of course, there were some sceptical voices, some people raising some, some important issues. Um, but we had a good discussion about this um, last year through a series of meetings. Um, but we didn't face too much opposition. Now, we had already done things a little bit differently at Queen's. We had um, sort of post-crisis reformed our, our, our programs and tried to give something more than just the introductory economics that most of us had received in our, in our university education. Um, but we kept a sort of a, a principles type course and tried to complement that with other courses. So um, I myself, I taught a, an applied economics course to first year students that tried to sort of plug in the gaps um, that we thought were, 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 were there from an introductory economics course. Um, looking at subjects like uh, the environment and inequality and globalization, topics that we thought the students, and we, from talking to the students, knew they were very interested in, but didn't get enough attention in, uh, in the sort of principles type course. So in some ways, it wasn't uh, completely revolutionary to bring in core for us, but nonetheless, we were uh, very interested in doing this because of the, the, the offering that it, that it, 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 it gave us. Um, again, we were really 
interested in what the students thought of this. We discussed this with students um, and their uh, feelings were overwhelmingly positive in terms of adopting core. Um, now it's hard to get a representative sample of students to give their opinions. Most of the students that tell you what they like are the engaged ones already. But pretty much we're, we, we think that, that the students um, um, uh, will like what, what's, what's on offer. They've engaged with core. We talked to them about what it would mean. And it does align very much with, with what the general sort of student population seems to be saying about how economics is taught. And this just makes life, life easier for everyone not just about the NSS, but also our day-to-day -day lives, dealing with students, fewer uh, students sort of dropping off the grid and, and, and not engaging in, in lectures and in tutorials. And if we can minimize that even slightly, if we can reduce those numbers, then that'll make everyone's life easier in the department. Many other reasons that we, 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 we thought were important in terms of adopting core, the fact that so many places have actually brought, brought core uh, on board is a really um, an important selling point, and that was made it very easy to convince people who don't maybe know too much about, about core outside of economics that this was something that, that, that was the, 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 right way, the right thing to do, that this is the direction that the economics discipline is, was heading uh, and that we should be, you know, uh, at least n not behind the curve. Um, of course, we were interested in other things as well that we thought maybe core could, could shake up a little bit in terms of gender gaps in, in economics, whether this was something to do with the way economics is taught has been, has been mentioned um, in many, many places. And if core can help in that way, then, then this is a very positive thing. So just to, to talk a little bit about the practicalities then, um, we were a little bit daunted, of course, by the, the, the change, okay, that this would mean extra work for people who are involved in this. It means a lot of prep. Once you've established a course, the, the uh, uh, additional work each year, of course, is very little. So the investment had to be made up front. But luckily, we, as soon as we sort of started looking at the resources that were provided by CORE, we were very relieved to see just how much was there uh, and how much support there would be there for us in terms of preparing for the, uh, the year ahead. So this is a really, really unique uh, uh, sort of selling point for CORE that there's stuff up there on, on the website and it seems to be updating all the time and more and more uh, 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 materials up there for you to, to teach, including assessments, including um, tutorials and videos and everything that you really need to teach this, this program. Um, I mentioned the sort of implications of CORE in terms of our offerings at, at, at Queen's. This meant we had to rearrange basically everything in our first year to fit this CORE module in. Um, and that took, uh, you know, some modules had to be dropped and other new ones had to be created. And because we were being taught by other, uh, by the finance group was teaching some of our students in economics, they had to be brought on board to make sure that they were happy with the changes that we were making and vice versa. Um, now that was a bit of a headache, but we did see it as an opportunity then to really rethink um, quite fundamentally how we were teaching economics in first year beyond core. Okay, core was going to be part of their economics offering, but it wouldn't be the only subject, of course, uh, that they would be taught. So we really took that as an opportunity to see what we could do and how we could best um, complement core. I mentioned that we reduced our, our class size for this introductory course. Um, and this does have implications for resources, and that we would have to actually um, expend more resources to teach the same number of students that we were teaching uh, the, in the previous year. As I said, we were teaching several hundred students in one group in the, in the Principles of Economics course, um, and we wanted to, to target our own economics students, those who had chosen economics as, in, uh, as their degree, uh, with the core uh, 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 and, and not have to have too big a class size that we thought would be unmanageable. We were already right up at the, the, the sort of um, uh, room size constraints that we were struggling each year to try and find a room big enough to get uh, uh, all of our students in. Um, and we thought that we could uh, uh, try and sort of uh, adapt to, to, to avoid that problem. So we actually are going to be teaching the uh, ESPP part of core to the students that we had previously taught on other degrees. So those who are uh, accounting students or, or um, uh, finance students will be receiving that course. Okay? And then the core, the economy, is going to be directed uh, specifically at our economic students. Uh, and there we go. So just the final thing that I think uh, people have already mentioned, both Robbie and Tara have already mentioned, the sort of things we have to think about uh, in terms of the knock-on effects of core. Um, what does it mean for what we teach in first year? What other things we offer? Um, 
one module we decided to create alongside CORE was, was one that was focused on helping students and helping economic students develop their communication skills. So looking at CORE, seeing what, what would best go along with this um, to give us a, 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 a better student at the end of, of three years. And we thought this was an important thing, having um, taught you know, up until to, to the, the third year and people can't, don't seem to be able to have the writing skills, the communication skills, presentation skills, the data presentation skills that we would want our economics graduates to have. So we thought in the first year we would bring this in to try and uh, uh, get that, give that to them early in their, in their university careers. We don't know exactly how that's going to go, but we will probably report back at some point to see what, uh, uh, what happened there. But in the second and third year, this made us rethink what is going to, to be provided in the years ahead for these students. How best can we utilize this, the, the foundation that's been, been laid at core in the first year to make sure that there isn't duplication in the second year, there isn't uh, um, stuff that is, is, is completely new, that it follows naturally from what they've learned in the first year, both in terms of content and the, the, the expectations and the approach that the students have. So that's the sort of challenges that we will we'll face and we'll try and work through in the next couple of years. I think that's all I, I, I wanted to say. Great, so, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. And Gerhard. Okay. Thank you very much. I also bring up some slides to kind of keep my brain uh, uh, kicking in the right buzzwords. Um, and... Oi. With is better. Here we go. Okay, uh, as you might uh, <clears throat> hear, that I'm not native yeah, English speaker. Uh, sorry, I'm here. Good. I'm not native English speaking, and I uh, do speak. Uh, I do teach at a German university, which uh, faces some similar challenges that uh, Tara uh, mentioned and uh, some very different challenges that are sometimes good and uh, sometimes not too good. I mean, one of the challenges is that I don't have to coordinate with anybody to introduce CORE because by constitution I have the right to teach whatever I want as long as it's in the field of economics. So I don't have to ask anybody. Uh, however... <coughs> uh, Could you just introduce your university? Ah, yeah. um, I'm at the University of Düsseldorf, which is at the Heinrich Heine University of Düsseldorf, which is HHU, and um, we are a big public university, and uh, we have a hosting at the moment around 600 incoming econ students every every uh, term. Good. <coughs> so, um, what I actually kind of planned to do was to introduce CORE because we introduced a new program. Uh, politics, philosophy, economics program, and I was teaching a standard microeconomics course last year for PPE students, and what happened was that uh, PPE students come and uh, did it is with very different skills and interests and expectations of what economics actually kind of is about. So they were confronted the first year with the standard micro course and I didn't talk anything about exchange rates or <clears throat> inflation or anything like this and they were kind of uh, uh, disappointed uh, not to hear of what they heard of everyday economics in the newspaper. So I kind of coordinated then with my with our head of department and we kind of talked what we can we do here and say okay good we can kind of give them some basic or baseline economics course where we kind of use language as well and uh, introduce concepts in language that students can understand. And this brought uh, me actually to uh, the idea to introduce uh, CORE. Good. Um, furthermore, we would need in, our, in this new course, we need to collaborate with uh, faculty members from uh, philosophy and political sciences, which is also not 
very easy at times because they are also kind of talking different languages. And uh, if you want to kind of look at the curriculum of the PPE as it's kind of put up right now, uh, in philosophy they have kind of logic in the first year. So kind of one has to kind of connect those things somehow. And this is also one idea is kind of to try to see what the others do and try to kind of translate this in economics and make in economic terms and languages and kind of translate this between them. And uh, the next challenge that we have is that it's the first course in economics and it's large for my standard which is around 400 so we are not at 1200 so which is uh, really huge but already four to five hundred students are not easy to manage and in, in, a, uh, in large lecture halls and uh, when they doze off, when they kind of just see indifference curves, this doesn't make teaching too much fun. Good. Um, the challenges, what we do, so uh, we are at the department where we are basically microeconomists uh, and most of the teaching that comes after the first year course will be microeconomics. They have some introduction to macroeconomics, but basically we are a department of trade people, I.O. people, and some behavioral economists doing education and labor. So basically all topics that are micro. So <clears throat> they shall have some type of solid foundation of um, microeconomic concepts. And this is, will be my role uh, delivering the core course. And uh, ideally relate those concepts to the reasonings in philosophy. And uh, this should hopefully then meet the expectations of the students. So they kind of, that they get a feeling how economics reasons and how this is based in principles of, of philosophy. So this should hopefully improve student satisfaction by uh, quite some uh, points because what we got from the first year teaching standard uh, microeconomics is that there was a huge disconnectedness between all those subjects. And I think the core uh, <clears throat> actually kind of tries to mitigate these type of problems by asking questions rather than kind of presenting models as if true. And this is kind of one of the uh, things that to do. The general course setup that I have uh, available for, for me where I can kind of deliver this are 56 contact hours in, a, in, in one semester and of 14 of them are uh, reserved for exercise sessions. So we are a bit restricted on kind of uh, what we can do. So I have to do 14 exercise sections because it's written down in the module handbook. So I have to do this like this. And the rest I have to do lectures. So this is kind of the not so nice thing about the, the, the system I'm in. I'm kind of, I'm pretty restricted on the methods. I'm not restricted on the content. So I, I have to kind of stand in front of people and deliver lectures. So that's, uh, that's one of the challenges, but also. Uh, <clears throat> over how many weeks? Uh, over 14 weeks, 14 to 15 weeks. So that's, that's what we have time. And uh, I was kind of thinking to, to capture students, I kind of I came up with some slight reorganization of what I want to kind of bring my students near is kind of talking first about chapters 1.6 to 1.8 of kind of explaining them a little bit about our capitalist system we're living in at the moment. So kind of to, to take them where they are, kind of getting their everyday language, kind of see how everyday exchange actually kind of looks like and then uh, um, getting them involved and kind of getting them into their personal everyday life and introducing economics in, in these interactions. And then I would like to do uh, a course that's something that came up over the, over the uh, last course all the time when these students were asking, okay, good. Is our system not completely broken and is our, is our capitalist system not the, the worst ever and are we all uh, doomed in the next couple of days? This is kind of, I mean, I think this is kind of 19 year olds who are very idealistic and want to change the world. It's a very natural uh, <clears throat> way of approaching things, but you have to kind of th put things in perspective, I think, and uh, this kind of uh, uh, helps, I think, chapters 1.3, 1.9, and in chapter 2, 
how growth and the system are actually kind of related. So kind of you, 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 you take a little bit of this discussion already up front and kind of then start discussing more about content rather than about uh, a plant system critique, which I think is not very helpful and uh, also doesn't let people kind of think too much. Then I would like, and this is I want to bring this quite uh, on quite early because I also thought this was something very important, is the, the methods economists use. Because as we heard before as well, the kind of people are not used to this type of abstract thinking in models. And uh, they also kind of have this idea then when this is the first and the only course sometimes that they take in economics, that they go out then and say, this is what my econ teacher told me and 20 years later they said, oh, this is a herd when they are in decision maker positions and then they said, I heard this is what the economist said 20 years ago when I was in undergrad. And uh, that's why I have to do it like this. So we kind of, uh, th that's not how we want that people go out in the world, but we want to kind of see or introduce them to models as what they are, as kind of some description of reality, which is by no means the final say about how reality kind of looks like. And I um, want to introduce them to the, to the concept of parsimonious modeling. And another thing that was not yet, or what I didn't find too much in, <clears throat> the first part of a book of the core, but in the Doing Economics, Project 3, is kind of a little talk a bit about statistical inference, but also especially, because this is something that economists are very keen on at the moment, or should be very keen on at the moment, is um, the careful analysis of cause and effect. So this I also want to kind of introduce together with modeling, because these two things should actually kind of go hand in hand, because one is the, the core of why we what we think about it, and the other one is kind of, does it kind of square with reality? And these are kind of the two things that I want to bring on quite, quite early, because then this takes away quite a lot of doubts and questions, I guess. So this is my, my, first, my first hunch on that, uh, that it takes out quite a lot of questions and doubts people have when they come to uh, economics classes. <clears throat> Good. Uh, and then my, my plan was to just follow uh, because I think it's a very nice and the right order here. The selected sections from, from chapter 3 to 11, which basically gives some foundation of microeconomics, so which I will spare most of the macroeconomics part. Good, so this was kind of my plan, how I would like to use uh, core, and I'm very grateful for any suggestions and, and ideas I can take away from this workshop. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So, um, yeah, so th I think, I hope that, th that we've somehow conveyed four very different perspectives on uh, what it's like when you're in there, when you've taught it for a bit, uh, as Tara said, uh, Robbie's experience with this extremely challenging landscape of students located in three continents, roughly speaking. Uh, so dealing with time zones and, and massive technological issues, uh, let alone uh, trying to transform the, the content and to design a way of getting uh, student engagement and, and uh, all, all of those problems that, we, that we, we all face. But somehow when the students are actually you know, three rows from you or even at the back of the lecture theatre, you have more of a chance of uh, at least gauging uh, whether they're engaged or not, which I think it was was one of your uh, one of your problems. So um, we've got um, 15 minutes left of this session. Uh, what I'd like to do is to uh, try and engage uh, as many as, uh, of you as possible in in very short snippets. So so one or two minutes, just introducing yourself and uh, the the way that you have used or are planning to use core. So it just, just really with a show of hands, someone who wants to contribute first and we'll I'll, uh, run around the room with the microphone. So who's got, yeah. Great. Uh, okay, Izzy, Izzy's at the back with the microphone. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm Francesc Trillas. I'm from Autonomous University of Barcelona. Just a comment on, on the typical metaphor of, of maps, because I, I struggle with that all the time when using core or, or when using other methods. We have all used that metaphor, right? But the, you know, the difference is that maps are true, okay? And models are not true. That doesn't mean they are not useful. I mean, they are useful to build up concepts, 
but they are basically artificial constructions, artificial, artificial logical constructions. But I think that it is misleading for our students to tell them that models are like maps. They are not like maps. With a map, you can go out and find your way if they are good maps. With models, that's not the case. With models, you know, it's, yeah, yeah. it's, a, way, it's a way to think. Okay. I would have to say I, I disagree with that, and that's the whole point. When I show my students the map of the public transport system in Dublin, if they wanted to drive around Dublin, that map is completely useless. And it's not a true model, right? I mean, the way the lines are drawn are not where they are geographically. All of these really important aspects of the city are missing, but it's really useful for what they're doing. But if they want something else, they need a different, a different map. So I don't think that maps are true. So, so a different model. Yeah, it's yeah. a different model. Yeah. OK, great. Next, who's up? Um, hi, uh, so I'm Patricia Mello and I'm at the uh, um, Lisbon School of Economics and Business. And I've just uh, started a new role as a, well, Director of Studies for the Undergraduate Degree of Economics. So my question to you uh, is not so much at this stage about the content, but rather how did you manage uh, to work and change the, the, the well the, the working dynamics of with, of your colleagues. So just to give you an idea, on average, each one of us has a teaching load of 10, 9, 10 hours, and we don't have teaching assistants. And I mean, I, I just don't quite know where to start. Not, even before I start talking about the content, just the things that require being changed. So I just wanted to ask, what were the main challenges for you in terms of convincing the colleagues to work with you and finding ways of actually giving them incentives because that's the other difficult well maybe this is a very complicated question yeah this this is a question that will run run o over today and tomorrow but I think Alan uh, maybe you can you can comment on this yeah, uh, yeah no it's a it's a real concern and that's what most people's kind of objections um, when you talk in the group is you know what is the the implications of this for for me for my teaching for my time um, any change does require the investment and extra time uh, ahead. I think it's important for core that the people that are put on core and who are going to be in charge of it are people who are enthusiastic and, and actually believe in this approach and will actually change the way that they teach rather than just try and deliver core in the way that they're used to delivering um, the material. So I think you, you almost need to have people in place that are believers in, in the, the, the approach, and I think that makes things a, a lot easier. And a, and a small group of people working together like that shouldn't really have any um, um, problems in terms with, with, with knock-on effects on other, other um, faculty members. So really, it only for us anyway, it only affected the, the people who were teaching core directly rather than anyone else. Uh, Robin, can I ask you to comment on, because you've, you've had a a fairly slow burn process um, at Warwick. Yes, um, slow burn, but, um, but but bubbling away in October 2019. 2019. 19. 19. Just a few more months. So, so in our first year um, economics module for joint degree students, we're going to be rolling out core in term one on the first half of. Of, of the book. I'm avoiding using old-fashioned terminology like micro and macro, of course. Um, and the slowness of the burn is, is a result of that transition cost that comes through the delivery of the small group teaching. That's, that's been the, uh, the handbrake for me in, in feeling able to roll it out. Can because, Robin, can you explain yeah, what so, small group so teaching we're, is? We're all familiar with the fact that the way in which predominantly we teach undergraduate economics has not changed for a very long time. So it's very easy to ask colleagues, including graduate teaching assistants, to, to, to deliver classes on things they're familiar with, um, on the theory of the consumer, the theory of the firm, markets, because they've been taught it themselves. It's not just intellectually fairly straightforward. Um, it's something they're very, very familiar with. So the, the, the big jump that we all face in wanting to deliver core is going to that new equilibrium where we're asking people to deliver in what I think of as a radically different way um, to first year undergraduates, both the material, almost every dimension you can think of is up for play. 
um, philosophically, pedagogically, you name it. Of course, you have to be much more modest than that to make those first steps. But I think that first step is a very difficult one in asking colleagues who are very familiar with developing the traditional model to do something really rather different. And that involves a lot of training. And in higher education in the UK, we are, we are all stressed by the amount of research and teaching and administration we do. Um, we actually have rather little, rather less time for training in our sector than I think we should in, as teachers. And core, quite rightly, to do it properly requires that training. And, and, and this is all part of that. The, 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 um, the, the road shows that core produces of this one is a sort it, it is, a, is, a, is a, an example, a very, very important in, in dissemination. Um, uh, but, and training is crucial. It's so, it's so important, I think, that um, the core project has taken that, t uh, is that training of TAs and TFs as, a, as an important ingredient for precisely that reason. But we, we, we've got there we, in Warwick. We finally got there in Warwick. Okay, good. So who, who, who's next up? Yeah. Uh, right here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Matteo. I'm from the University of Bath. And I've been teaching um, the economy in the past couple of years. And this year, for the first time, I started to teach uh, economic society and public policy. Uh, in a master course for mature students. Um, so very different uh, experiences and I'm happy to, to share it uh, over these two days. Um, I just wanted to stress that I find myself in a lot of experiences that emerged uh, in the previous uh, presentations. In particular, uh, given that um, as a Department of Economics, we are in the middle of a curriculum transformation at Bath, um, I think, well, I try to persuade my colleagues that this is a worth investment. And the way I, I persuaded them, or I, I'm trying to, um, well, I invited Michael here to just join our department. He's going to teach Michael in the first year, starting in October. So that's one way to <laughs> persuade them. Um, I think uh, there is a problem of setting expectations. I totally agree. In particular, uh, some of my uh, senior colleagues find out that in the second year, students are still in intermediate courses, are still trying to approach the question and solve the problems in the A-level mentality, in the high school kind of setup. And one way I'm trying to sell core in the first year is to tell my colleagues, look, we are doing a service to the further courses that come later uh, where a more advanced thinking uh, is required by you know, helping the students to open up their minds in the first year. So I think one way to sell it is to say CORE can do a big service to the rest of the curriculum by setting the students in the right position from the start. Very interesting, and that is something that we will, uh, we will we will we will come back to on a number of occasions. Is that is that helpful, Patricia? Is that yeah. Okay, great. Hello. Yes, my name is my name is Edward Johansson. I am from Finland, from the Åbo Academy University. Uh, I will start teach using core in teaching now in September uh, for the first year macroeconomics. So very, very exciting. I have many, many questions that I would like to, to discuss and ask you during the next coming days. But one thing that I'm very interested in is for like this big first year courses, do you in this room have any experience of not using final exams? Yes. So I, I would very much like, I hate final exams for the first year courses, but I, we, I have not dared to, to, to not use them so far. So I would like, very much like to learn your experience, uh, experiences of that. So that would be great. Thank you. Great, Among other things. <laughs> So, very quickly, for our first semester course, we've abandoned exams completely. We do have a final year exam, but it's much less important. The first semester course is taught th largely through a mixture of seminars 
and we're taking, we're taking an approach to say, what are the problems in economics? So we introduce students to five different topics. The one that I do is, um, from, is essentially chapter four of the economy. And uh, so I'm looking at ideas from Eleanor Ostrom. I'm looking at ways and some of the things about which, what, what we've learned for economics in terms of attitudes to fairness and justice. Um, and for students who are not studying economics, these are interesting things by themselves. But for those students who are studying economics, it's a very good example of, well, we're going to do something which you won't have seen any level. Oh, and also, it you know, um, Gerhardt has that slide up there saying the method of economists. One of the things which it's emphasizing is that economics, we can use experimental data, but importantly, we're using data and we're trying to understand regularities in human behavior. So it's giving a very different understanding of what economics is. Now, how we assess that is, is by a series of short essays during the semester, which are marked by student tutors, and then a long essay um, at the end of the semester so that we don't have an examination. And so students, it, it's something which we've worked at at my university and we found is very successful in the policy stream, which is actually to get students to reflect and to analyze. And essentially we're doing that in first year. It's a lot of work in terms of the assessment that's involved, but what we are starting to get are students engaging in a much more interesting way with the underlying subject. York. I, I uh, taught core for the first time last year, uh, had a few teething issues, and I think uh, this uh, theme, as you mentioned it, of uh, fitting it into established institutions, um, well, yeah, I mean, that, that's the ongoing challenge that I'm facing, and, and I'm, I'm thinking in particular in response to this question about assessment, that I've inherited uh, an assessment uh, practice of final exams, multiple choice questions, because that fitted quite well with um, I don't know, Blanchard and um, whatever the, the status quo, or Samuelson, whoever the, wrote the first textbook was. Uh, and it, I would say it did not fit well at all with core, um, the, the multiple choice, because I think it's, it's teaching higher level thinking. I mean, you can see it on this slide here that is, uh, we're engaging with the question, what is economics for? Uh, in a critical way and, a, and, and asking students to reflect. So I, I think I would endorse this, uh, this uh, continuous assessment um, way of um, getting the students engaged with, with core. As it, it's more effective than the multiple choice questions anyway. Great. Um, Dunley, do you want to comment on the use of multiple choice questions? Um, yeah, actually, um, you know, I, I'm teaching the, I'm using the ESPP, so which I will talk about. Uh, my name is Duny Li. I'm in the department. I'm in the teaching fellow of economic department at UCL. So basically, about this uh, using the MCQ as assessment of this uh, core. Actually, in our department, we use the MCQ to both this uh, economics module the, uh, for economic students. And meantime, I also use this uh, MCQ as a part of assessment for non-economic students uh, as another course, which I will talk about later on. So at this point, I will see the MCQ. As you just mentioned, that in terms of higher level thinking, actually, I think it's really depend on how you design the question, right? And also, MCQ here, actually, we have some discussion uh, regarding this MCQ assessment. It also depends on how you, how you design the marking scheme. So now we have discussion regarding whether we should use a negative marking or not. So for people who are not very familiar with negative marking, so means that if the students, if they, if the, if the answer is wrong, so tr the traditional way is to get a zero mark, but negative marking means they will get a penalty. So get either minus one mark or, or, or for example, half mark uh, uh, penalty. So now here, what the, this marking scheme actually is designed that way that to try to prevent students from this random guessing so it means that if if they if if they, if they're guessing if they just throw a dice try and this is true or false this one they they get penalized. So in this way, we we'll force students basically they really reveal what they are they're truly thinking. So from our department, so we basically experiment a few ways. So in the first year, I mean we did this basically uh, with this negative marking basically means the half 
based based on a minus one point mi minus one for this uh, true answer uh, for this uh, false uh, for this uh, wrong answer, and then we recently abolished this ne negative marking, and turns out the marking distribution has been significantly changed. So basically, significantly increased. So now we have discussion whether to basically put this uh, penalty like a, a half point. So even we'll see how it works. But I will see whether we use MCQ as a part of assessment. I think this also depends on how you design the, this uh, this uh, MCQ and how you set up the marking scheme. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Carlos, I think wants to check in. Hi, uh, uh, Carlos from the University of Exeter. Um, just sharing my experience uh, of final examinations, what I decided to do was having a combination of essay questions to test these reasoning, uh, uh, more advanced questions, but also multiple choice questions, but designed pretty much in the core way. Each multiple choice question can have more than one correct answer. By introducing that, it really changes the way the students learn and the way they have to uh, address the question. Because you can have one correct answer or you can have four correct answers I in the same question. So students cannot just uh, follow a process of elimination to choose the, the, the correct one. They really have to read the questions carefully. They really struggled with this concept. It wasn't popular at all, obviously, but I trained them by introducing lots of homework, weekly homework tasks, so students by the end were quite used to the process. And it really allowed to develop questions that tested higher levels of, of, of knowledge, not just the superficial definitions, but actually to really make sure if students understand the concepts or not. So it's just, just another way of doing things. And uh, one, one of the things, we, we just to pull this session to a close, one of the things that's going to happen throughout the two days is that um, we've got Paolo here. Paolo, are you here in the room? He's probably outside. Anyway, Paolo, who's been coordinating the logistics of the meeting, um, is, is the community manager for Core Labs. And Core Labs is the a part of the website where you can, you're invited to contribute, for example, your excellent multiple choice questions, Carlos, which I think you already have. And that means that we're building up this, uh, this resource so that if you're teaching in a very large class, if you're teaching 1,200 people, maybe you can avoid multiple choice questions. But many of us teaching very large classes have to use some element or feel that some element of multiple choice, if well designed, um, is actually a good way of, of uh, incentivizing students to cover the whole uh, course instead of just to pick and choose particular bits where they could write an essay, for example. So I think there are, there are some pedagogical merits in, in well-designed multiple choice, and it's certainly one aspect of this project to really explore the, the, the nature of, um, of those kind, ki kinds of questions. And we are, we're really seriously engaged in uh, building out that resource, and we also need uh, testing to be done. We have uh, interns who test these questions. The best people to test any multiple choice question is a student who's sitting an exam. So uh, feedback from you about questions that don't work, that where there are ambiguities that your students are complaining about, that's really part of the process, part of the core method. You have to feed that back to us, uh, send it, you know, lots of easy ways to do it, um, so that we can improve those questions. And then I think we'll really have um, an ever-changing and improving resource for those who, who find it useful as part of their assessment. Okay, so uh, we're at the end of the session, so thank you very much. I think um, we've got off to a very good start.